chapters 13 through 15, where you read the, uh, the, the tragic events involving uh, Amnon and Tamar and Absalom. Go back and read 2 Samuel chapters 13 through 15 and look at the, the, the terrible uh, division that, that came about among David's children because of sin. That's what sin does. It divides. What about the family of Hosea, the prophet? Read Hosea chapters 1 through 3. And uh, you see that sin had crept into the life of Hosea's wife, Gomer, and it caused division, separation. Sin divides. It separates a man from God. It will divide a man from his family. And it will divide a man not only from his physical family, but from his church family. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 tells the story of uh, a man uh, who had involved himself in uh, fornication, was living in fornication. And uh, the church had actually become proud of the fact that they were so loving and compassionate that they would accept this man anyway. Paul wrote and said, you need to withdraw your fellowship from that man. You don't need to be uh, giving a blanket endorsement of his sinful conduct. You need to withdraw yourselves from him, separate from him. And they did that. But why did they have to separate? Sin. Because that man sinned and refused to get out of it. It will separate a church family. And then the ultimate division that will result from sin is that final separation, that final division that the Bible refers to as hell. 2 Thessalonians 1 verses 7 through 9 says about those that will, uh, that will receive vengeance, that they'll be uh, destroyed, everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. That, uh, that eternal torment will be a separation from God, division. Jesus will say to some on the day of judgment, Matthew 25 verse 41, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Division. Sin's ugly. It's hideous. It, it causes separation and division between people and God, between families, church families. It's an ugly thing, and we need to stay as far away from it as we possibly can. What are some of the other consequences of sin? Well, sin not only divides, it destroys. Sin destroys. What kinds of things? Well, Sin can destroy your good name. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 1, that a good name is to be desired even above great riches. A lot of people put uh, a lot of um, value on monetary gains, getting money. That's what a lot of people live for, just to make more and more money, to get more and more stuff. The Bible says that even more valuable than material possessions is a good name, a good reputation. What happened to names like Cain, Jeroboam, uh, Jezebel, uh, Ahab, Judas? Those are Bible names. Do you hear many people, you know, a lot of people like to name their children after biblical characters. My wife and I did with our two sons, Amos and Daniel. But do you hear very many people using Bible names like Jezebel, Ahab, Judas? What happened to those names? Those names were forever tarnished because of sin, because of unrighteousness. That's what sin will do. It will destroy your name. But what about in uh, more modern times? When you hear the name Benedict Arnold, what do you think of? treason, a traitor. You don't hear many people today naming their son Benedict Arnold because that name has forever been destroyed as far as any association with that which is good and right. That's what sin will do. It will destroy your name. I've spoken with my sons before about the importance of a good name, a good reputation. And uh, I want them to, to grow up uh, to be the kind of person that, uh, that when other people think of them and think of their names, they think good things. 
I want them to think, yeah, I, I know that parish boy. He's a good boy. He's a good young man. He's faithful. He's dependable. He's loyal. I want them to have good things associated with that name. But sin is not going to do that for you. Sin will do the exact opposite. It'll give you a bad reputation. It'll destroy your name. It'll also destroy your body. And the Bible warns us of that. Uh, immorality will destroy your body. That's why 1 Corinthians 6 verses 18 through 21 says, flee fornication, flee sexual sin. And Paul goes on in that passage to talk about how uh, other sins are not necessarily against your own body, but sexual sin is a sin against your own body. So he says, remember that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And so you should glorify God, honor God in your body. Now, 1 Corinthians 6, 20, don't use it for sexual sin and sin against your own body because not only is it, is it, uh, is it wrong simply because it's sin, but sometimes those kinds of sins can bring additional harm to your physical self. AIDS, sexually transmitted diseases, those are sins that destroy the body. But if sin was not committed, then you wouldn't, uh, then, then people wouldn't have those, those difficulties, those problems. Sin can destroy your body. Sexual sin. What about uh, drinking? Wine is a mocker. Strong drink, a brawler. And those that are deceived by it are not wise. Proverbs 20, verse 1. In Proverbs 23, verses 29 and following, uh, we read about uh, the consequences of lingering long uh, with alcohol. Redness of eyes and sorrow and wounds without cause and, and, uh, and contentions and all kinds of things. Drinking will destroy your body. What about worry? Worry can harm you physically. Jesus said that we shouldn't be anxious. Uh, but that we should trust God, Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34. But how many people worry themselves into ulcerated stomachs and worry themselves so much that the stress builds up and they end up having heart attacks just because of stress and worry? Well, what is worry? Sin. Sin will destroy your body. Sin will also destroy your prayers. You want to talk about destruction? And the consequences of sin, what does it do to your prayer life? Psalm 66 verse 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. I wonder how many prayers never get past the ceiling because the one praying has, has harbored and continues to harbor sin within his own heart. Sometimes we have those pet sins that we like, the sins that we've gotten used to, the sins that we've been able to rationalize and live with. And instead of, uh, instead of doing some spiritual surgery and cutting those sins out and throwing them away, we just uh, we, we harbor them and we enable ourselves to continue to do them. Well, God says, if you continue to harbor iniquity in your heart and fail and refuse to deal with it, he will not respond to your prayers. So some people waste a lot of time praying when they ought to be spending some time doing some genuine repenting to make sure then that they can be heard in their prayers. Sin will destroy your prayers. Peter warned in 1 Peter 3 verse 7 that, uh, that husbands' prayers, that, that a husband's prayers can be affected and hindered if he doesn't have and maintain a proper relationship with his wife. Give honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, that your prayers be not hindered, 1 Peter 3, verse 7. How many times do we ever think about the relationships that we have with our spouses to make sure that those relationships are what they should be? Because if they're not, it's going to hinder and hurt our prayers. Sin will destroy your prayers. What about lack of faith and trust? James 1, verses 5 through 7 is where James says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. He gives to all liberally and upbraids not, but let him ask in faith, nothing doubting. 